digitization program office of the Smithsonian, and Carolyn Thome of the Office of Exhibit Central of the Smithsonian. They serve the entire Smithsonian. I'm just with one museum, so they have to work for tons of other people like me all across the institution. They have a big job to do. You can see what they've been doing so far. They have to do that for lots of other clients besides me. So, Vinay uh, Chish, to the rest of my team, you can see how hard they work. Uh, and they'll be going right into presentations after uh, we kind of introduce the topic about how we got into the, in a sense, the, the business of using 3D technology with uh, Klingit cultural preservation. And uh, I'll let uh, Edwald John start us off because it really started with work with, with the Dakloedi clan. Gunakchish. Gunakchish. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Adam. Carolyn. Um, a few years ago, Eric approached me about uh, this new technology that I was um, that intrigued me because I'm a, a technology instructor. Anyway, I teach for the state of Alaska technology, and I've been working with technology since 1986. And um, he, he he brought me down to the Smithsonian Museum and said we have this technology in which we could make a replica of, of, of your clan hat. And I said, well, really? And um, he asked me to bring down a killer whale clan hat to, to start our replication process. He called it the 3D technology. And I wasn't familiar with this technology, um, and I just had to see it. And one of the reasons why um, Eric is up here and uh, we talked extensively about um, uh, displaying this uh, 3D technology to people here at the conference. And I was all for um, um, showing, sharing his knowledge and sharing uh, what, what they could accomplish with this 3D technology. I have a clan hat, Kilowell clan hat, and I see several of our Kilowell clan members in the audience. And what what they did was they took uh, a clan hat that was in the 1900s, dated back to the 1900s, and made a replica of it. The, the, and they're going to explain, uh, Adam and Carolyn, Eric are going to explain the full technology of how this works. My job is just to introduce uh, myself and the clan. I'm Dukhluwedi. I'm Dukhluwedi for... Um, uh, making this happen and it's it's pretty amazing and the purpose of the, the technology is is not to replace carvers I, I know in a couple of sessions before this session they were worried uh, one of the questions they were worried about you know, replacing the carver this is not the purpose is of this is to replace a carver, but to allow clans to um, replicate their atu, which is very precious to us in the clan, and be able to store it, digitally store a replica of your clan hat, which is pretty amazing. And then uh, if, if something were to happen to our clan hat, then we have an exact replica of that clan hat. In this case, one that's dated back to the 1900s. Also, uh, another part of that, part of this uh, technology, is for the museum to have a replica uh, on hand for any carvers that are interested in looking up closely at the, at the clan hats. Um, as Eric mentioned in a, a session a couple of days ago, that, you know, a picture is great, but if uh, a carver or, or somebody who wants to do research on uh, a clan hat, they could actually hold it in their hands. And and the, the process that that Eric uh, did with this, it's very he's very thorough, and uh, we we go through a lot of conversations on the phone and email about the process and about getting authorization. So it's not like you just grab the clan hat, made a copy of it, and they're going to do whatever they want with it. That's not the whole point of this. So whatever is going to be done with this 
he he always comes back to me. He always contacts me and says, uh, "Can I do this? I need permission from you and the killer whale clan. Can we do this?" So it's a very thorough process. I, and uh, uh, Eric is adopted killer whale, so I trust him. And uh, with with that, I'd like to turn over this technology process and let them explain what they are doing with this technology. Finish To set the stage for the uh, technology, there has a, a little bit of a history as far as the history of this object and the history of the uh, clan with this object and the technology that goes back to Mark Jacobs and the, uh, the repatriation of the original hat. And for that, it really started with uh, Jacobs' family and uh, uh, their history and the Daco 80 history with this hat. And I'd like to invite uh, Harold Jacobs to come up and uh, introduce that and provide the history of the lineage and the house and the uh, Gush Dehim. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. <coughs> this hat was made for Gush Dehim, who was the head of the Killer Whale House in Angoon around the time of the bombardment and up until around 1908 when he died. The hat was made by his by an uh, in-law, Dikye Snawu. Dikye Snawu was married to Sakhasken. Sakhasken's mother Katkatu was at was a sister to Gushtahin. So it was the in law who made this hat. And I'd seen this in Swanton's publication and I knew the name Gushtahin from my father's family in Angoon. And the records indicated that it was collected in Angoon, it was in ceremonial use, and it was a true emblem of the Dutch lady. When I was finally able to go to in Washington, D.C., I arranged a visit to the museum to look at this hat. <coughs> and that was in 1997, during the inauguration of Bill Clinton. I want to make it very clear, I was not there for the inauguration of Bill Clinton. I just happened to be there. Well, this is when I we were able to get these pictures of my dad with the hat and he was pretty pleased to see it and the association with his name and lineage and we 1997 and late 90s everybody was still really new to repatriation and how to work it how to how the process worked. I think we now we have a pretty good grasp on the way it should work, even though we still run into some roadblocks with false counterclaims on things. This is really another clear-cut case of the lineage and who it belonged to and who made it, because there's other items that Dikyesh now will made, including a hat that was still in my dad's family. So this was 1997 when we first saw it, and we just kept exchanging emails, I guess, and working on it until he got so sick that the process sped up considerably. I think that's all I have on that part of it. In 2003, the clan mother was feeling really bad about losing so many family members and all her brothers and sisters being gone. So she wanted to have a party. A kuik is not just a memorial party to pay off somebody. A kuik is an invitation to a feast to dedicate a house, to have a memorial party, to dedicate a new blanket, to dedicate a new object 
Lucy D.A. says, Art. I don't have Archie Bell's picture in here, but Lucy Deasis' father was from the Killer Well House, and she remembered when her grandfather had a party in the Raven House to pierce her ears when she was five years old. So she had this party in 2003 just so she could hear her ancestors' names again, and I made this placemat for the party so people could see people's names who were being called off like across the top from left to right is Pete Kanosh that's Bessie Sam and Joe Kanosh's father his name was Cleok Heat my grandma next to him Annie Jacobs and her older brother Harvey whose name was Sa'at Jimmy George's mother Shawat Gluch and Jimmy George next to him Gutskutzeh Next to him is his sister Lily Edwards Awaste. And then their two brothers Johnny Skin Day and Charlie Spina. The second row is George Lewis, whose mother was actually a first cousin to my grandma, but he was raised by Carrie Lewis. Doss Nag, who's in the next picture to him. And my grandma's brother Frank Paul, Pa Nate. Gwenatin from Cake and Edwell's great grandfather George Brown next to them, her, whose name was also Tleakit, and Nathan Take. Next to him is Judson Brown from the Finn House in Klokwan, Chaco Cooney. Then up above him is Lydia George's father, Cyril's grandfather, Cyril George's grandfather, Peter James, Custe. And then next to him is Robert Jamestown, Edwell's grand uncle, Shaquane. Down on the lower left is Gush Dehin wearing the other killer whale hat and holding the dagger. And above him is my Aunt Rosie on two up. And on the other side is my grandma's cousin. His name is Nosk, which is also one of Archie Bell's names. The image is the killer whale chasing seal that was on one of the houses in Angoon. And above that photo is Dan Katzi, Keith Ishanki, and Ed Casco, Sukhis. The image of the dagger. Next to the dagger is Peter Duncan, Kako. Next to Peter Duncan is Edwell's uncle, Dan Brown, Kuskus Khan. Next to him is Pa Chooks. And on the lower right is John Nelson. Edwell's great great uncle. His name was Clay Saish. And on the very lower right is Larry Edwards. Keith. All of these people are from various killer well houses, but this was a plan hat belongs in a certain house, but it's the symbol of the whole clan and belongs to the clan, even though one house will take take care of it. So even though this hat was connected to my dad and we knew the lineage connected to it, the hat belonged to the whole clan, not just my dad. My dad was just the caretaker. These are my grandparents, Mark Jacobs Sr. and my grandma, Annie Jacobs. My dad's family and 1952. Um, I have many of you know my Aunt Bertha Karras. She's in the upper right between my dad and my Uncle Ernie. My grandma's father was John Paul. She had an older brother named Harvey and a younger one named Frank. And when their mother died, their father married Nazi. Susie Bennett, who was from Sitka, who already had two children, and there were five more after that. But there were Kogwantons, so they were from a Sitka lineage. Frank was the youngest. His names were Kanek and Udeshka Dunik. This was my grandpa's second wife. 
grandfather, great grandfather John Paul, and they had Emma, Dora, George, Patrick, and Matilda. And the man on the left was Nazi's first husband. Nazi is an old woman in the picture next to him. She had two previous children before him. But they were from a Sitka lineage, so they weren't connected to the hat. My dad's family married predominantly Deshi Tom. His father in the lower left was Deshi Tom, whose daughter was a Deshi Tom Yeti. Her father was Kotlain on the lower right. And his daughter was a Deshi Tom Yeti. His, her father was Yesnawu in the upper left. And his wife was a Deshi Tom Yeti. Then her father's in the upper right, Kilish Nujik. Her name was Kishnaf. One of their houses in Angoon was the Killer Whale House. They called it Keat Hit and Wuchtakudden Keat Hit, which was the killer whales facing away from each other. This depicted a split in Tsagwa Hood Bay that was built by the sons of Gushtehin, who were on Kuska, on San Gushu, Ayes, and Akta. But the house front was painted by Dickie Snawu, the same man who painted the made the hat. The killer whales were painted over in 1928, but the weathering left an impression in the wood and you could make out the killer whales and they were repainted in 1979. This is the lineage of the killer whale house. That's my father's line, the second line up of Harvey at the bottom, Harvey, my dad, Hamilton, Ernie, Bertha, Rose, and Franklin. And then their mother was Annie Jacobs, whose mother was Mary. Mary had a sister named Elsie, who was George Lewis's mother, and a brother named Archie, and Archie was married to a Deshi Tom. Their mother was Skosken. Skosken was the daughter of Katkatuwasat, who was a sister to Kushtehin. Skosken had a sister named Nyakhsahat, who was the mother of Peter Kanash. Katkatuwasat was a sister to Kushtehin. Bushtahin is the one who the hat was made for. Actually replacing the objects. Some of the objects re that were destroyed in the bombardment. He was also the caretaker of the killer whale dagger. That's also here. And then his mother's name was Gok. We used photographic evidence for this too. This is a picture taken before the bombardment. The man third from the right is Gushtehin. The man laying in state, lying in state, is Dekit Dekain, his father-in-law. And the older killer whale hat is laying next to him. That one was lost in the bombardment. We don't know whether it was. looted, taken out of the village, or destroyed in the collapsing houses. Dickie Nawu was the head of the Raven House. His father's name was Yana Chuk Tequiri, whose father was Deshi Tom, my great, great, great great grandfather he was a well known carver replacing objects in Angoon and as well as making objects that are known to have been in Huna including the wolf house posts that are in Huna I know where some of the other hats are that he made 
when Angoon was bombarded, he was a teenager, and he grabbed the beaver dish and the sea urchin dish and ran into the woods with them. He ran back to get the raven hat, but the ra raven house was already collapsing in the flames, and they held him back. So they lost the raven hat, and the raven hat he's wearing was made around 1884 to replace the one that was lost in the bombardment. But as an in-law, he was commissioned to replace the killer whale hat. He also did other hats. That hat that's sitting next to him is also under claim right now, and hopefully that'll be back this year. These are some of the carvings that he made. The wolf hat in the upper right, a wolf hat on the upper left, the bear hat in the lower left, the beaver hat in the middle, and the killer whale hat on the lower right. This is the picture that I first saw, but that's in the Swanton publication from 1908. And my dad got a copy of this book from Sergei and made notes on that page by the hat. And this is the museum notes on it. Can you read that, Eric? I can read it here. But it reads, a wooden hat representing a killer whale. This was worn by as, as a true emblem by Gush Dahin, a killer's new man of the Dakhlawadi family, but had only been in use four years. The detachable dorsal fin is ornamented with women's hair. This is Gush Dahin and his sons. Gush Dahin is wearing the killer whale hat and holding the killer whale dagger. And uh, two of his sons who painted the killer whale, or built the killer whale house, are with him. Billy Johnson holding the paddles. His name was Ayesh. His wife was Kogwantan from the Eagle Nest House. Her name was Sakshatusti. In the upper left is his older son, Billy Jones, on Gushu. His wife was Tequiti. On the right is their, his daughter, Christine's daughter, Yik Tusan. The man in the back was named Shkogyes, but we don't know which house he was from. Uh, this is the this is the killer well dagger here that he's holding. take over from here in 2004 my dad was pretty sick near the end of the year and he had never told us how sick he was I had to hear it from someone else and at times he looked good and at times he looked bad and beginning of December he looked pretty good and around Christmas around the beginning of the month he was pretty bad but by December I thought he was improving some but then when I could see him failing, we took the killer whale hat and dagger and some other things and put them in the room with him so they'd be room, in the room with him, knowing that his time was short. And this is about where the museum stepped up the progress. Our report assessing the repatriation request was in progress for a while, as Harold mentioned. And it can be a long process because we were evaluating a lot of information and for uh, other objects as well. And in the course of that, the, the approval process, or the review process, goes from a lot of stages. It may start with me drafting a report for the museum, and it has to go to my uh, program manager and then curators who are responsible for these Arctic collections and Alaska collections and then the assistant director of the museum and director of the museum and undersecretary of science and secretary ultimately of the secretary of the entire Smithsonian approves my reports and you can imagine we have to allow certain periods of time for each of those people so our, uh, we were already recommending that this hat be returned as an object of cultural patrimony we recognized that it was hot uh, and we were recommending that to the museum administration. And it was in the middle of that process when we learned of Mark's condition and how bad he was. And we learned that the clan had gathered his atu around him in the hospital. And we knew what that meant. 
from our work with the Klingit people and from our readings of history, it had been long ago recorded that this was a practice that was done when the clan understood how dire the health was of their clan leader. Uh, I think Emmons wrote that they gathered the Adu around him so he could communicate with the ancestors through the objects. And so we knew what that meant. <coughs> and we knew that if we missed the, the time and got it to him too late, <coughs> it would become a masterless object and it would be in a kind of limbo as far as who do we return it to, who represents the clan that we could return the hat to. And so we asked the museum administration, we explained it to them, and we asked them to approve quickly. <coughs> the director of the museum, Chris Jones, in Paris, <coughs> seen here uh, approved it and told the undersecretary of the Smithsonian that that's what we need to do and they agreed as well and he said get it there as quickly as possible and so we called Harold and said it's coming we had to rush but we had to take care and how we did it even then and with speed and uh, the director authorized me to get it here as quickly as possible and we were packing the hat on New Year's Eve, the conservators were training me on how to pack it because TSA might make me open up the box and I might have to repack it again. And so we were doing that on New Year's Eve when all of the Smithsonian staff had been released and allowed to go home early for New Year's Eve and the director, and we were about the only ones in the museum and he came up to see the hat off at that time. And they made a special box for it. Very quickly, the head conservator of the museum created a special box so it could travel with as little damage as possible. We were worried it had been in the museum for 100 years in climate control condition. We were worried that the wood, when it came to Sitka in January, would be exposed to cold and different humidity that might cause the wood to literally crack or explode open. It would be even worse if we brought the hat back and had it op opened up and had it break right before our eyes, right before the eyes of the clan. So they made this special box with humidity control uh, gel uh, packets to control the humidity within the box and then sealed up the box with plastic and taped it up really good so it made it kind of like a little airtight chamber that the hat would travel in so it could control the climate within its own box. And so we got it up here and they told me I couldn't open it for 24 hours so I could bring it here and we took it to um, to Mark's hospital room and showed, it, showed him the box and said it's here but we can't open it yet because we're afraid it might break and uh, he understood that and we had to wait overnight and uh, the next morning we brought it back and we had opened, Harold and I had opened it up and made sure that it was in good shape and we brought it to Mark and we signed it over and it was legally as far as Western law and the Smithsonian was concerned it was legally back to the Klan but we understand that that's not completely legal and done under Klingit law it has to be witnessed by the opposites so Harold had gathered the Klan leaders together as many as could be gathered in the hospital and I'd like to turn it back over to Harold to talk about what happened next with that but that was the Smithsonian's tiny role in, in that process we had quickly gathered some clan leaders together and Herman Davis brought their Kovo hat over my grandfather became their brother when one of their brothers died and they were always very close and Herman and his brother David came over they put the they took the hat out of the box and placed it on the table and put the coho hat beside it other ravens who had heard about it at the last minute showed up then Herman Davis and David placed the hat on my father and uh, some other wolf clans were there to witness that Reggie Peterson from the Wooshkeeton and Ben Diedrichson from the Finn House in Klokwan the hat was placed on him and now it was officially back in clan hands something in this picture that I noticed was that the three objects in the background the spirit of Wuchkadaha riding the crane, the headdress there and the dagger and the robe were all repatriated but the robe was a shaman object that couldn't be used and about two weeks later it was at my dad's funeral it was buried with him 
but he lived to see this returned and was quite happy. He was too weak to stay through the whole ceremony. Actually, our ceremony was interrupted by someone who wanted to give me something and did her own program in the middle of this and lengthened it and kind of interrupted it. It kind of annoyed me that when you have a ceremony going on and then someone comes in and does their own thing right in the middle of your ceremony that kind of throws things off. And it was sad that my dad couldn't couldn't stay until the end of this. He had to get back to his room and get to bed. But we were able to talk about it later, and Edwell came to see my dad the Sunday before he died, I believe. He died, left on Sunday, and three days later, when my dad died. He was very weak. He tried to stay there, but he spoke about the family in the hat and seeing it returned, and was glad that it was back home. He died. 13 days later at his funeral all these objects came out again including the hat which is yeah I see Ben Diedrichson standing on the left and then Edwell next to him and then Garfield and then right below Garfield is the killer whale hat. At the 2007 memorial party for my father, the hat was turned over to Edwell. Edwell is from another house, but this is who my dad wanted to take care of the objects for the clan. And Edwell has done good. We have the paperwork that showed what my dad wanted and I carry it a bit further when we turned the objects over at the clan conference here five years ago. Yes, five years ago. Well, this is the way my dad wanted it to make sure that they were all kept together. At that memorial party, this hat was placed on Ben, who was also charged with looking after the objects. I'm going to point to something in the back there is one of the clan members from Edwell's house, Jimmy Malcolm, wearing the killer whale hat from his house. And Edwell was the fourth caretaker of that. And there was a bad accident in 2008 when the hat was dropped and it shattered the rim. So there's a possibility there of having that scanned so that hat could be repaired or preserved, putting it back together with that imagery. The hat is still in need of being repaired. It's just it was a pretty bad break that happened in it. But here's the technology here that could be used to preserve that. This is Armando, that big kid sitting over here, <laughs> who's not so big in this picture. Archie Bell had four names, Gushtehin, Nosk, Stuteh, and Dana Wu. Most people knew him as Dana Wu. Irene, do you remember Archie Bell? No? Lucy Deasis' father? And... Armando got the name Nosk, Antonio got the name Donawu, which means death all around because a killer whale will slaughter everything around it. And Joshua's name is Stutek, baby killer whale asleep in the ribbon cup. But afterwards we realized he should have been called death all around. I remember at Celebration 2004 maybe, I saw three kids go by with paper mache replicas of this hat. I, oh no, who made those? I had no idea how closely related they were to the family because I didn't even know them then. But the other killer whale hats were brought out and danced together on Here Come the Killer Whales. There's Armando dancing 
in the middle. And then we're back to the Smithsonian again to talk about the imaging process of those, right? So, so the Smithsonian understood that this was an important story that shouldn't stop with the return of the hat, that we see repatriation as an opportunity for continuing to build relationships or restore relationships to what they should have been even before repatriation or without repatriation. And so we thought, how can we, how can we help tell the story of this repatriation and the importance of these clan hats to the public? When we return objects, we often we don't have the object to show the public to talk about it, to tell anybody. Repatriation, we can never do an exhibit on repatriation because the object always goes away from us. So we wondered how we could do that, and we talked about technology uh, that might make this possible with Edwell. And, and as well, as he mentioned, he's a computer guy. He knows a lot about computers and understands the potential there. And, and some of this was, uh, well, actually, I'm the... Uh, I'm the dumbest when it comes to computers among everybody here. So, but I was able to help make introductions between the Klingit and the computer guys that really know what they're doing here. And so my job is just a liaison between the experts and the experts. So Harold and Edwell brought the hat back to the Smithsonian and allowed it to be laser scanned so that there was the possibility of, of uh, exploring making a replica of it. You see Bob Sam there that uh, I think the other day uh, it will pointed out that Bob asked, uh, can it scan my face? And so he stood down there and they scanned his face and it appeared on the screen right there on the on the laser scanner and uh, everybody was pretty impressed with that. It, it can do some amazing things. Once it captures the digital data, the millions of points in space, it puts it into the computer and once it's in the computer, then uh, these guys, and they'll show you a lot more about it, so I'm just going to introduce this kind of technology. But once it's captured in there, the, the information is captured in there about it, there's lots of things that can be done with it to clean it up and to make it uh, presentable in different forms. And you can see here even color can be captured from the image to uh, be applied. And one of the forms that, what, one of the things that can be done with it is the computer can guide a CNC routing machine to carve it out and then it can be painted. Here you see it being painted based on photographs because the, the model makers that work with this, they didn't actually get to see the real hat. It stayed with Edwell. It stayed in use in ceremonies as it should be. And so they had to work on photographs for the painting of it to try to get it as close as they could. And you see here the original hat and the replica. And here before us is the original hat on the table and the replica side by side so you can see the, the finished products there. And this is the team. Uh, there's other people that help with this too, but this is as many of the team members that we could pull together at the Smithsonian uh, to take the picture. Because they finished this just, what, two weeks ago? A week and a half ago? It was finished. And so this is as many as we could assemble to take this picture. So you can see that it's not just us here before you, but we represent a lot of people who contributed to this. So the original hat can be back in ceremony where it belongs here in Alaska and among its people but we can still have the technology can still aid us in telling the story. Now I'm going to turn it over to uh, um, Adam and Carolyn to talk about how they do this kind of work and what other projects they've done to give you a clear understanding of what this technology has done, where it comes from, and how it can be applied to cultural preservation for the Klingit. I have to take off for a few minutes, but I wanted to say that both of these hats will be danced, will be danced in tonight, so that one will be danced in tonight for the first time. We kept threatening to turn it upside down, put money in it, and kill it, and make it clan property, and they couldn't take it back, but we won't do that. Thank you. All right. I'm Adam Metallo. I work for the Digitization Program Office at the Smithsonian. Um, going to get our presentation started here. So it's been an incredible pleasure working with working with these objects uh, for the past few days. Um, I haven't done a lot to earn the ability to work so closely with these objects, so I really uh, appreciate people being so forthcoming, and I hope this is a valuable service to all of you. Um, it's been uh, very exciting for me to, to 
to work here uh, and work with the killer whale, killer whale reproduction um, project as well. Um, so thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to give sort of a crash course on what 3D digitization work means at the Smithsonian. Um, and this is for the purpose of giving you all a little bit of context of how the technology is being used um, in the museum world as a whole. And hopefully you'll get uh, some more creative ideas of how to use it in your own context here. Um, so I'm going to start off uh, even broader than the museum world and talk about where these technologies came from. Um, they were developed in other industries, really. Uh, so there's the uh, engineering and architecture world uh, and CAD modeling, computer-aided design. Uh, there's the medical world um, and medicine with uh, CAT scanning and X-ray CT scanning. Um, so we're looking at uh, you know a living heart and a living uh, skull here. So they can look inside of us now without having to slice this open like they used to have to do. So pretty profound implications in the medical field. Uh, of course, Hollywood um, readily utilizes these technologies as well. So it seems from Benjamin Button where they're able to make photorealistic actors uh, from completely digital processes, Avatar. Um, and then, of course, the gaming industry, which has raised the bar really high for authenticity and photorealism and documentation with these tools. Um, so this is sort of where the technologies have come from, and this is kind of where the bar is set for us to um, do similar work in a museum world. So my role at the Smithsonian is to try to um, uh, look at the broader implications of 3D documentation. So once we've scanned something, we have a, a, a fantastic record of a given object, but we also want to figure out how else those tools can be utilized. So it could be used for 3D models on the web for public access. Um, it could be used for research, could be used for conservation purposes. Um, so I'm going to give you a little bit of a crash course on uh, what the 3D tools might look like beyond what you've seen here at the conference um, and what the data looks like and what the processing workflows of the, uh, 3D data looks like. Uh, so when we talk about 3D, we're not quite talking about the 3D glasses experience at the movies. We're talking about something a little bit more uh, scientific than that. Uh, 3D capture tools come in a variety of different packages um, and a variety of different costs and price points. So you can spend tens of thousands of dollars on a given 3D scanner like this. Uh, whereas this 3D scanner only costs a few thousand dollars, I think this is about three thousand dollars. So it's not quite cheap, but it's fairly accessible in the scheme of things. Um, and 10, 15 years ago, this same equipment could have cost fifty thousand dollars. So it's pretty exciting to think that this technology is quite accessible uh, to just about everyone these days. Um, we also have a medical CT scanner at the Natural History Museum at the Smithsonian. So this is the only way that we can capture the interiors of objects as well as exteriors. And Carolyn will talk a little bit more about that in the context of uh, rattle replica that's up here. Um, all the other scanners are line of sight. So just like with photography, um, if you can't see it within view, um, you can't capture the surfaces. So interiors are, uh, or we can only capture exterior surfaces with other scanners. Um, these are the three main tools that I use in my work. So we have. Uh, on the right hand side there, the articulated laser arm scanner, which we brought here to Sitka. And this is good for objects that are about, I'd say, softball size on up to maybe human scale. We can go a little bit bigger than that with a, a scanner like that, but it takes a lot more time to, um, to go much bigger than a, a human sized object. In the middle, we have a long range laser scanner, and that will capture objects that are, I'd say, vehicle size on up to entire buildings, uh, chunks of landscapes, uh, archaeological sites. So you could think about this in terms of larger canoes and, and things like that. And then we use a lot of traditional photography equipment. So the photography is to um, match the geometry captured with the laser scanners with color information. But you can also process images into um, uh, accurate 3D data. And the exciting thing about that is that the use of these tools is going to be quite inexpensive in the near future. 
where you can uh, use a point and shoot camera to take many photographs of an object and then process that into 3D content. Uh, so we're excited about this in the museum world. We can ex afford a few expensive tools, um, but we won't be able to implement the technology readily until the prices come down and the expertise necessary uh, becomes a little bit more accessible. So this means that other museums throughout the Smithsonian, uh, or more museums throughout the Smithsonian and throughout the world will be able to use this, these kind of processes. Um, and it also means that um, anybody interested in the technology can access uh, 3D capture techniques. So uh, we're using a replica of an Olmec head that's behind the Natural History Museum as a kind of uh, mascot for how 3D processing workflows work. Yep, this is this is probably six feet tall, eight feet tall, something like that. So. We actually captured this with uh, about 100 photographs and then turned that into 3D data. Um, but any of the tools that we previously discussed can create uh, this process before you here. Um, so the raw data from all of these scanners uh, is called a point cloud. And a point cloud is essentially thousands, millions, or billions of accurate X, Y, Z coordinates. Um, so it's a pretty simple format at the end of the day. Uh, so it's a long list of numbers uh, that could be pretty uh, easily reproduced or written in an Excel spreadsheet, but then we can put that through software to visualize them uh, in 3D. The next step in the processing pipeline is to essentially connect the dots, and then you have a surface, a digital surface, uh, made up of that, from that point cloud that digital light can reflect off of. The object now has volume, is a little bit more visually coherent. And then the next step would be to map color back onto the geometry. So we have a uh, measurable, accurate, three-dimensional model with color information at this point. So that's a very simplified, generic uh, 3D di processing workflow here. Um, but hopefully that gives you a little bit better context for what the data that we're creating looks like. So now I'm going to talk about some specific examples um, of the work that we do at the Smithsonian uh, beyond these projects that uh, we have here on the table. Um, it's important to rem remember that I think that the mo I'd say that the most important thing about documenting objects in this way um, is not the replicas you could make from them or an online viewer necessarily. It's that you have um, a really accurate, robust record of the object that you can do many different things with. So there's oral histories, there's written histories, there's photographic documentation, there's video documentation. And this is just one more way that we can document our histories. Um, beyond that, there are some really cool, exciting things that we can do beyond the uh, pure archiving uh, and conservational implications of 3D technologies. So what you're looking at here is the gunboat Philadelphia, uh, one of the oldest surviving American fighting vessels from the Revolutionary War. Um, this is a pretty big boat, and it's about 50 feet long. Um, currently, it's at the American History Museum. The museum was actually built around it. There's no way to get the boat back out. Um, it's a very large object, and it's in a very cramped space currently. Um, so you don't actually have a very good visual of this particular object. You can see sort of the front, and then you can see um, over the edge of the boat on only one side. It's dimly lit. So although you can go visit the um, impressive object and sort of experience the history in person, you don't necessarily have a great view of it. Uh, so what we plan on doing is, or what we did is 3D scanned it, and we'll be able to make visualizations so that people can see the nuances and details of this object that haven't been visible to the general public and uh, most of the museum employees for uh, decades. So this is some raw data here that we're looking at. Uh, again, uh, po called a point cloud. Millions of XYZ coordinates. And this is the polygon model. So these are just initial renderings. But you can see the polygon model is uh, much more uh, visually coherent and, and easier to look at than the uh, uh, point cloud. And yeah, this is still just uh, images that we created directly from the computer. These aren't photographs.
This is texture mapped. We gave it a generic wooden texture. Eventually, we want to texture it with the actual uh, information in a sort of one-to-one -one kind of way where the photographs are mapped directly onto the geometry where they belong. This is a video rendering of that scan data. So although this is a really large object, it's about 50 feet long, uh, 40 men lived and worked on this boat from day to day. So um, there's no below decks. This is pretty cramped quarters. So we'll be able to model um, 40 men on this boat and tell the story in a little, much more visceral way than was before possible. The next object uh, we worked on was the Wright Brothers Flyer, the first airplane. And we documented this in a very similar way to the gunboat Philadelphia. Um, it's interesting to know that the Wright brothers were actually bicycle makers by trade, and they had a bicycle on display next to the Wright flyer, and we decided to scan that while we were there. The educators at the Smithsonian were excited that they can, they can now relate the parts on the bicycle to the parts on the airplane in a way that uh, were too difficult for them to, to show side by side in the gallery or online. So it's pretty cool to get up close to this and see that um, largely this is all bicycle parts that you're looking at the first airplane was made of. And this is something we'll be able to convey more readily with these models. So again, we're looking at point clouds here. This is raw data. It's not quite cleaned up and processed and pretty. This is a raw point cloud rendering. Um, the next project we worked on was uh, called the Cosmological Buddha at the Freer Sacklery Gallery, which is an Asian art museum. Um, this is a Buddha figure with very low relief, detailed, nuanced carving. And it's actually really hard to read the story in the gallery. Uh, the figure is placed fairly high on a concrete block. Um, the lighting is not such that uh, it really brings out the highlights in the, on the nuanced carving. And this was once painted to bring out the, the uh, information in a more sort of colorful, diagrammatic way, and it was much more easy to read at one point in time. So there's a really complicated story um, about heaven and hell and earth somewhere in the middle, the story of enlightenment. And um, it's very difficult to take in all the information when you're experiencing this object in person. At least it was for me, I should say. Traditionally, researchers uh, take rubbings on the object, so uh, you can lay paper over and use a piece of charcoal to, to bring out the detail in the object. Um, unfortunately, this kind of fractures the story. It's hard to relate what's happening in one section to the next section. And it's also a fairly invasive process. So there's a lot of examples throughout history where people have taken rubbings year after year for 100 years, and eventually the object starts to, to degrade. So with laser scanning techniques, it's a non-contact process where um, it's much more gentle on the objects and puts the objects at less risk than traditional documentation. Um, other methods involve making a mold where you pour rubber over an object and then cast another material into it. And that's also a very uh, dangerous technique to use on uh, irreplaceable objects. Again, with uh, laser scanning, it's a non-contact process, and so the objects are not at uh, risk in the same way as these traditional methods. So we took uh, two or three days to scan this with the articulated laser arm that we have here. And this is one of the first renderings we created. So this is not a photograph. This is uh, a digital rendering. And uh, our first crack at this, uh, the detail has popped out a whole lot more than it, it, it does in life. And we think we can push this a little bit further. This was just our, our first attempt. We also want to take this a step further. So this is not our work at the Smithsonian. These are uh, pillars in Egypt with similar low relief carving. They were laser scanned and then uh, photo mapped. From there, you can actually take these three-dimensional objects, unroll them, and flatten them out into a photograph. Um, so when ancient Egyptians try to make your life difficult by 
telling their story in remote uh, giant pillars. Uh, we have tools now that we can um, document them and readily research uh, the stories being told. Um, yeah, I'm, I was, I'm working on a similar technique with the killer whale hat. I haven't quite tweaked it out yet. Yep, the big cat. So we hope to do this with the Buddha. So it's essentially going to unwrap the Buddha like you would unwrap a globe um, or pelt an animal. And we'll be able to flatten out the story. And it will be a much more uh, readily accessible way for researchers to study the object. And it's also a way to put the information online for educational purposes. Um, another project that we recently worked on was in Chile. We worked in conjunction with the Chilean National Museum and National Geographic. Uh, they're expanding the Pan American Highway, which, which goes up and down South America on the West Coast. And they bumped into some whale fossils. And Chile has some really um, reasonable laws about not uh, plowing through these irreplaceable objects. And they did a proper excavation. But unfortunately, they, they did a very quick excavation. So the context for um, these fossils uh, is already gone. This, the road is um, just about built now. So we went down to Chile to document the rest of the site. And uh, there were about 40 whales discovered overall. Um, they left eight of the best preserved fossils exposed for us to go and document. So we're looking at uh, a set of whales called La Familia. So they're two adult whales here and one baby whale in the middle. It's kind of hard to make out. I think I'll have a better picture coming up shortly. So a traditional method of documenting a site would be to do hand drawings where you would uh, grid out the sites uh, in one meter sections and then outline where the bones laid. So we're able to cap capture much more detail with these tools in about the same amount of time. So the first thing that we did was we photographed uh, the site from above. And we're able to take many different photographs of the same object from different locations and then process those images into accurate 3D data. That works very similar to, the, to um, your GPS in your car, the way it uh, triangulates from multiple satellites in the sky. This is a slightly better view. You can see two large whales and on the left-hand side a baby whale. So we used just about all the tools we had for this project. This is a long-range laser scanner. Again, good for capturing entire landscapes. Um, laser scanning at night is actually a benefit because we don't want the laser to have to compete with the sun, so we work through the evenings. And then uh, this was the first time working with this articulated laser arm scanner. So uh, we wanted to see how big we could go, um, and we scanned this eight meter long whale. Um, we don't hope to do something this big with this scanner anytime soon again, um, but it was really exciting to think, think that uh, it is possible. So we captured this um, sub-millimeter resolution and hope to make a one-to-one -one scale replica of this object at the museum. So this is one of our first renderings from this data. So again, this is not a photograph. This is all digital XYZ coordinates with digital light reflecting off of it. We were able to make uh, small 3D prints uh, pretty quickly. Uh, within about a week of returning from the site, we processed photographs into uh, 3D data that could then be printed at a small scale. And Carolyn will go over the nuances of 3D printing in just a moment. We're also able to do a lot of real-time uh, blogging and interviews on the site, so it was, it was pretty exciting to get the information out there to the public uh, in real time as we were scanning in this instance. And at this point, I can pass the mic over to Carolyn. My name is Carolyn Thome, and I work for uh, the Office of Exhibit Central. The reason it's named that is because we do work for all the Smithsonian museums. Um, we, are, we are not dedicated to one museum in particular. 
Um, I am personally part of the model shop, so we make um, replicas, models for exhibits, for uh, research. Um, I've personally worked on uh, the Gem and Mineral Hall at, at the Natural History Museum. I've recreated a few mines, uh, one in Arizona and one in uh, Virginia. And uh, I've also uh, worked on the Mammal Hall. I sculpted a uh, life-size manatee and a nursing calf that if you are ever there uh, or have been there, it's hanging from the ceiling. And um, uh, also worked on the insect zoo, uh, sculpting some bronze medallions of various insects that you find around your house. Um, my part of this, or I should say the model shop's part of this project was to produce the actual three-dimensional output from all of this uh, hard work and uh, scanning of the killer whale hat. Um, we used, uh, which one do I press, this one? Okay. So as you've seen before, this is the, um, the scanner that we use. This is called a Minolta 9i. Um, that This one can actually capture color, although we didn't use that uh, for this project. But this is the, uh, the scanner that we use to capture this data. This is the data, which uh, Eric showed you earlier. Um, it looks like this is before it was what we call cleaned up. Um, there are some artifacts. Uh, Sometimes we're finding that uh, some of the paint, um, there's a reaction between the laser and the paint, and it's actually shown as a, a raised sort of image. So you can see, um, I can't show you specifically on this picture, but some, mostly the reds will show up as raised. So you have to go in and, and kind of get rid of that. And there's this great software called Geomagic um, that will help you sort of reduce those effects that are undesirable. Um, that's why it's good to have lots of photographs of your objects so you know what is really there and what is just paint. Um, here's a, a video of the, um, the Keat hat being milled on our uh, CNC milling machine. It's about a minute long. So all the data collected with the scan was converted into our, uh, our CAM software, and it guided all the cutting tools. And you can see it's, it's starting to form the shape of it. And all this work was done by uh, my coworker, John Zastro. And this was all cut out of alder that was provided by somebody who might be in this room, but I don't see him. Uh, and this is John Zastro. He's he had um, hand cut all the abalone and is placing them into the hat. This is uh, Laura Collins. She did um, she did the painting and she did the um, ermine. She attached all the ermine, which Eric purchased for us, and he purchased the abalone too, right? And this is the painting, uh, and she is also inserting the hair in the fin. And then there's the finished replica, which you can come up and see after we're finished. Um, another uh, project we decided to take on at the last minute was um, we had uh, some Huna rattles that had been CT scanned. And uh, they were scanned because of their interior information. Uh, they were scanned with a CT scanner because of their interior information. You, could, uh, you can see the rattles inside. Um, you can see the, uh, how the inside of the rattle was carved without taking it apart. And in fact, uh, this rattle was scanned with all of its packing intact. I don't, um, I don't even know if the rattle was exposed. Was it exposed? It wasn't even exposed. It was still in the box. And um, so 
I had to go into the excuse me. I had to go into the data and get rid of the packing, um, which you could see. You can see bubble wrap in in uh, on the digital version of it. And that's not where I wanted to go. practice this? Can we practice? We were like, we don't have time. So uh, so this is uh, partially cleaned up data from the CT scan. As you can see, all of this in here, this is all part of the packing. Um, this is all supports that were uh, in the packing. So I had to go in there and digitally remove all those and uh, try to distinguish what was part of the rattle and what wasn't. Let's see. This is going to be a little awkward, so please bear with me. Um, so after I cleaned it all up, I was able to get a, uh, a 3D rendering of the rattle. Which is a pretty cool thing to see. <laughs> And here's the, this is the original rattle right here, which is still at the Smithsonian. Yes. Um, we also were able to, yeah, this is not the version we wanted. Um, uh, we're doing some color matching. What I wanted to do um, was our, our 3D printer is able to print in color. So, um, uh, I wanted to uh, intrinsically color the print with the wood color so I could start off with a proper base instead of trying to paint it to look like wood, which starts to turn in a little too opaque too quickly. So that was us um, doing some color matching and figuring out what the proper color was to apply. These are uh, the actual printed rattles that were from inside. Sorry, these are the beads from inside. Um, I was able to uh, extract those and put them back into the rattle after it was produced. Uh, yeah. Here's the me taking the rattle out of our 3D printer that we have at work. It's a um, it's a, the printer is a powder-based printer. It lays down layers. Um, this rattle was probably it was on its side. That's how I printed it. So it was probably about 600 layers, and uh, it works similar to an inkjet printer. So it'll put down a bed of powder, and uh, wherever there is data in that uh, that layer, it will deposit binder. So in the end, you will, and then the binder will um, attach to itself in the layers. So in the end, you will have a solid object surrounded by a bed of powder. Uh, uh, point zero 0.08 millimeters. Um, this is uh, blowing the powder off of the print. And you will be able to see the final print. This is why this is the wrong presentation. <laughs> uh, but the final print is up here. You'll be able to come up and see it afterwards. And we were also able to get um, a 3D rendering of the, the key hat also. Um, another um, nice use for um, the digital capture is that if you have an object that is broken or has a missing part, like this rattle, all this area is missing from it, you can, uh, in the software, you can create a mirror image and replace that part. And that was something I did uh, just quickly just to demonstrate one of the many uses of this digital technology. And that is it.
I just want to give a little bit more context for um, where the Killer Will Hat replica project resides um, at the Smithsonian. Again, uh, we're talking about um, all these different all these different ideas so that we give you all more context for what could be done with this data in the future. Um, the data that we're capturing here of all the um, the ceremonial hats. Um, but again, I also want to stress. Uh, that the most important thing here is that we have a record. You don't have to make a replica. You don't have to make anything publicly available. Um, most important, you know that you have uh, this really incredible way of recording a history of an object. Um, but right now, uh, my overall project is to exemplify the use of 3D technologies throughout the museum world. So uh, most of the projects that I went over today are case studies of unique uh, uses for 3D scanning techniques, and the killer whale hat replica is definitely among the most unique and powerful examples, so we're really thrilled, again, to have been able to participate in this project, um, but we're also scanning uh, Abraham Lincoln's life masks. Uh, we'll be micro-CT scanning orchids and uh, be able to make 3D prints of very complicated uh, uh, geometry of these flowers. Um, so the, the killer whale hat will be sitting next to some uh, pretty impressive objects at the Smithsonian. We're really proud to, to have this as one of these examples that we were able to work with. So I'm going to leave it on a goofy little time lapse that we created of our work in Chile. And I think we can start uh, maybe opening it up for questions if people want to do that. Does that sound like the next thing to do, Eric? So while this is running, because this may take a little while, you're welcome to go ahead and, and start firing questions uh, at us. Uh, but again, we want to we want to thank uh, Edwell John and Harold Jacobs for uh, supporting uh, us. And, and this is a pilot project, not just for our work with the Clingit, but you can see it's a pilot project for the entire Smithsonian. It's being held up as a project that an example of how technology can can further the mission of the Smithsonian, which is really basically just the increase in diffusion of knowledge. So. It's appropriate for the sharing of knowledge conference. So, Gunak Chish. process, the CNC milling where you're carving out of a uh, material that you, you do know the properties of. So we can carve out of woods that we know how long they're going to be lasted, properly taken care of, or metals that could last much longer. You can see these guys document way too much. They just can't stop documenting. Everywhere we've been going around Sitka, they've been photographing everything and everyone, and just they just can't put So they're the perfect people for this project.
I did drill out a place to put the beans in. I got, you don't have to, but um, we were so short on time. I mean, I finished this the day before we left for here. Um, uh, you wouldn't have to, but the tricky thing is, well, you have to drill a hole, but you have to get the powder out, full powder. Um, and then uh, once you print this, the, the object, the printer the print is not necessarily uh, strong, so you have to infiltrate it. So some other kind of resin into it. And so um, this one is soaked in epoxy, so it makes it pretty strong. Um, it, it would break if I threw it across the room, but it, it, it's pretty durable. Um, and that, the uh, painted rattle that I made, uh, um, that I produced, was um, infiltrated with cyanoacrylate, which is a uh, crazy word. And I did stick my fingers together. Pardon? No, the base, uh, I did the paint on that, but the printer painted the, the base wood color. Yeah. So don't shake it too hard because it is still soft material, but we, she, she tried to infiltrate the beads to make them a little bit harder so you would be able to hear the sound, see that they are loose in there, and the printer can capture that. These are, these are rough. These are not yeah. fixed. Don't come back. Uh, it's, it's all pilot. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> we also have inside the sodium pots for our own people on an outside. This is an inside pot. say, you know, a small print would be anywhere from twenty to a hundred dollars and a very large print out of our printer would be, you know, a couple of thousand dollars. So the cost is going to vary greatly, object by object, the amount of work that needs to be put in it, the degree of painting that needs to be done in it. What do you want done done to it? You can paint it real crisp and nice and new looking, it'd be less work. But she painted this hat, and then she tried to age it to make it look just like the original, so she had to kind of buff or erase paint and, and touch it up a little bit. That's going to be more. So uh, it's really hard to tell, to give estimates. And that's it? Yes. Yes, thousands. Thousands. Shouldn't have. If I 
She's not done yet. <laughs> Aaron. Like you're unwrapping. That's a great idea. I mean, exactly what going to this conference is about is you know, finding new potential uses for the project. Reverse engineer it. <laughs> under your robe, <laughs> under, under. <laughs> don't look, doctor. <laughs> Our department has a CT scanner, so we can scan whatever we want. Right. Any other questions? Armando and anyone, anyone else who might know who's responsible for that uh, printer, please tell them we're here. Get them over here so they can have a chance to see what we're doing and interact and make some connections because uh, it, it's, you can see it's a, it's, a, it's a big deal for us to be able to bring all this equipment, all this expertise here for uh, an hour to present to you, let alone for four days straight. We may never be able to do it again. So whatever we can do to support local technology that could be used for this to make it easier for you to apply it. Um, and we'd like to try to figure out how to how to help um, in, increase and diffuse that knowledge. Any other?
<laughs> Please don't try that with my other prints. <laughs> that's, that's ABS plastic, like what Legos are made out of. It's a very strong, durable plastic. Right. You can also print directly in titanium. And it works. Yeah. Yeah. We have an exhibit where we print it in titanium. And, um, that's about as expensive as you can get, but it's also about as durable as you can get. Yeah, that's, we, we would have to work uh, with contractors. Yeah. But if you don't inherently need your own 3D printer, you can uh, have a model and purchase a print online. Yeah, just the way you order, the same way you order photographs online and you order print. So you see the range of the range of opportunities that this technology presents. And uh, so far throughout the conference, several clan leaders have brought forward uh, clan uh, crest hats and the Killowell dagger that you see up here have been scanned during the conference. And um, we may tomorrow be able to scan Cat Leon's helmet and so, and possibly the hammer. And so uh, we're trying to do what we can. Um, but um, we want to reiterate uh, what Edwell said. This is not intended to replace any, any uh, artists, any carvers. It's a tool. It's just another tool. It can be misused, but we are trying to advocate responsible use of it and use of it where it can complement what people are already doing, help them do what they're already doing, aid them to do some things that maybe they aren't able to do or it's very difficult to do, try to make things easier to preserve your culture. Gunachish, please uh, come and look at the objects here and the work. Uh, Edwell has something more. Pretty amazing stuff, huh? I am really, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning of this uh, presentation, I'm really excited, mostly because it's, it's it's technology, and I love technology. I've always loved technology, and um, the one of the primary advantages of having 3D prints created from clan objects is it gives you the opportunity to enjoy the object without having to um, you know, uh, go into a museum. You, you, see it, you go to a museum and you see it behind a, a glass case and, um, uh, or it's in the possession of the clan leaders and maybe you're in Juno, I'm in Juno and you're in Sitka. Well, this, this technology will enable you to, to view it and even touch it and we're encouraging you to come up and take a look at this now and actually, um, uh, if it's okay, let them hold the the, the replica Kilowell hat, and also um, you can also make small ones too. This is a small Kilowell made from that hat right there. It's not painted. It's uh, it's what, what do you call this? The raw material, the raw raw print, the raw print where you could go in there and you could um, you could actually paint that or you know. So uh, thank you. Uh, another round of applause for these guys. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you and. Please come up and, and take a look at the, their work. And, and, and please visit us in the control room, exactly opposite this room, where we'll continue to try to uh, do some on-site work.